Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is your girl Mitzi, and this is Mitzi, let's think about it. Today we are thinking about crowning yourself, creating the kingdom that you ultimately desire. You know, do you really think that's possible? I do. And that's the reason why I have a special guest here on the show, Kimberly, who is going to share her perspective and this journey and this great business that she was able to share with myself and hopefully the rest of you guys out there. Um, can you introduce yourself furthermore? Um, further? Yeah, you got it, Mitzi. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I am so excited to have a think on how to crown yourself because initially when I came up with the idea for the company, I'd like I I wasn't honestly in a place where I was actually practicing what I wanted to be preaching. And when I first started my company, I was just recently bought out of an e-commerce startup that I had been a part of as the president and grown for the past two years. I signed the buyout agreement three weeks before I got married to my husband, jetted off on my honeymoon. And for six weeks in Italy, I was like, ah, I don't know what I'm doing when I get back. And my husband and I were brainstorming as you do on your honeymoon. Of course. And I was thinking about all the passions that I had because I'd been a screenwriter in Hollywood. I'd had a brick and mortar Pilates studio. I'd had a very varied career. I was a president of an e-commerce startup. I had lots of different passions. I, I loved writing. I loved health. I loved business. I loved relationships. And I'd figured out different pieces along the way with overcoming an eating 10-year battle with bulimia, with healing and finding my amazing twin flame, the love of my life, the king to my queen after a series of um, not so great and even abusive relationships. Mm -hmm. And then coming to this place, of learning to love business, I knew that they were all intertwined, but I just didn't know how to how to do it. And so I really got tripped up on the how. But in that state of inspiration and way too many espressos in Italy, I leaped off the couch and I said, crown yourself. And my husband's like, what's that? And I said, I have no idea, but that's the name of my company. And crowning yourself, what it really stood for that I didn't lean into for the first year and a half of my business was it stood for a woman who owned her worth. It stood for a woman who claimed her power, who stood in her power, who was authentic AF and who really chose to build an empire from a place of service and who owned her stuff. The problem was, was that I wasn't leading by exam example for a year and a half. So I faked it till I made it. I did a whole bunch of like lovely photo shoots of like sparkles and crowns and every, uh, every bit of the person I wanted to be, but none of who I actually was being back then. And then I found out that I was pregnant. And then I realized that I was only cheating myself of my own self-worth. And I, if I continued, I'd be cheating my children out of seeing what it means to have a woman really step up and own her worth and build an empire that is based on servant leadership, that is based on being a warrior for possibility, that is from a place of authentic love for herself and for others others and respecting other people's authenticity and from that place of pure 100% ownership and personal responsibility. I mean, own is a part of crown. So it's literally in the word. But in order to crown ourselves, we have to take ownership and put ourselves at cause for our life. And I hadn't been for a year and a half. I'd been in a space of blaming and ashamed of where I was, ashamed of still like the perceptions of failures. I was doubting myself. I had massive imposter syndrome and I wasn't owning also the successes. I didn't own the successes of having a film that was bought and sold to Lionsgate was up on Netflix. I didn't own the successes of taking my e-commerce company in the span of just two years and pitching it to the first round of Shark Tank auditions or getting us featured on Times Square. Like I wasn't owning those successes and I was very skilled at owning my failures. And then I let those failures rule me. And I, more importantly, I let the fear rule me. So a yeah. key tenant in crowning yourself is first owning your mistakes, your story, your successes, your failures, and all of the bumps and hills and valleys on the road to claiming that queendom or claiming that kingdom that is yours. And what I define to be your kingdom is anybody who gets to inter be, gets to be blessed by you interacting with them, by you, by them coming into your world, whether it's on social media or on a podcast like this, or seeing your website or just seeing you in line at the grocery store. Like if somebody is blessed to have that moment of being in your presence and you in return, not from a place of ego, are also blessed to be in that presence of that king or queen, your fellow sovereign, then that is a place of mutual respect where we can start to see each other from a place of 
loving and embracing our differences, our diversity, our, and get curious about how we can grow our integrity and our, our roles as leaders in this world. Yeah, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. And it's funny that you say self-ownership. And I think that's something that's really important. And I feel like that's something that not a lot of people like to acknowledge when it comes to having that self-growth journey and having that epiphany and having that understanding that to really level up, you kind of have to confront everything. That means the ugly, that means the bad, that means the mean, the cruel, the evil, all the stuff that happened to you or that you projected out onto somebody else still needs to be acknowledged. And I think that's the thing is that when somebody let's go of their past and they say that they moved on they they get this like amnesia and act like oh I never lived that life oh that wasn't me oh I never did this but in reality it's like how can you really say you're in really self-growth journey if you can't accept the bads that you've done you know if you robbed a, a store when you were in high school okay admit I was I was a thief at some point you know what I mean like people will act like that's never happened and I love also how you stated that you acknowledge Acknowledge your success and every success that you stated, you, why not acknowledge it? You know, and I think that's beautiful that you say that because not a lot of people are afraid to share their success with others. And I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm like that. I don't like to tell anybody all the things that I've accomplished. I don't like it to announce to the world. I don't tell my personal groups that I've, what I've done that I've always wanted to achieve, but that's just because of my own little paranoia. But in my own self, I still give myself that acknowledgement that I've accomplished it, that I accomplished it. And I feel that people need to at least do that. If you don't want to share with the world, okay, don't share with the world, but at least let yourself know that you are proud of yourself. And I think not a lot of people do that. They don't have that moment of just say, you know what, Mitzi, I'm proud of you. You know what, Kimberly, I'm proud of you. We don't do that anymore. And I, and I don't understand why. Well, learning to celebrate ourselves is not something that's really taught in a culture that really perpetuates chronic high achievement, which means it's basically because I work with such high achievers and it's like, oh, did I achieve this? Okay, moving on. Okay, I achieved this moving on. And so what happens is, is that that trains our subconscious mind, it trains the actual reticular activating system in our brain to basically bypass the actual achievements that we've had. So the problem is, is that most people think that when they achieve X, Y, and Z, then they'll be happy, then they'll feel fulfilled, then they'll feel successful, then they'll feel worthy, then they'll do so. There's always this like if then belief system. But yeah, if you're yeah. constantly and chronically bypassing all the achievements that you've had along the way that have led to that space, by the time that you achieve that thing that you think will make you happy or feel successful or make you feel rich or worthy or deserving, you're going to achieve it and then bypass it just like you did everything else. And so, cause you have literally trained your brain to do so. That's not like woo woo. That's like you have trained your brain to not acknowledge the celebrations. And because of that, it's not going to see that you've achieved something worthy of celebrating. Yeah. Like for example, one of my clients, I, when we started working together, I constantly reiterate her achievements. Like within the first week of us working together, she landed a $40,000 client. And I was like, I, and I constantly, I bring that back every single month. I'm like, by the way, remember that, remember that client that you landed, you know, within just one week, because even high achievers get to that point of like, oh, it's just this other client. Oh, it's just, I'm like, no, that was, that was a high ticket client that you landed. Like mm -hmm. same with one of my other clients when she hired her first team member. And I'm like, you realize six months ago when you started working with me, that was an initial goal. Like we've already achieved that goal. You've already, you've done that. And so continuing to, to build in that, those reminders of your successes, you can do this in a tactile way on New Year's. I love New Year's for this reason um, of writing down all the successes that you've had in your relationship, in your health, in your business or in your career, in your uh, relationship with your kids, with your hobbies. Like if you started a new hobby in 2022 and you're like, I just feel like taking up tennis or trying fencing like that in itself is an achievement because you did something to grow beyond your comfort zone so yeah. what allowing yourself to keep a running tab on how freaking awesome you are not just from not from a place of arrogance 
But because a lot of times society has taught us, us to like not brag about what we've done. However, as I like to tell my clients, it ain't bragging if it's true. Like if you've done it, it's not bragging. Like yeah. if, you're, if you're still on that phony side of like not actually having achieved that and you're kind of like still in that wishy-washy space, then that's bragging. But if you've actually achieved something and you're like, yes, I've done this, this, and this, and this, rock on sister, like crown yourself with your achievements and also own your mistakes because it's in your mistakes. And this is what I'm currently teaching my four-year-old that <laughs> it, that's where the golden nuggets, that's where the crown jewels of your learning comes from. Success mm -hmm. can be a really crappy teacher, especially for high achievers because we bypass those accomplishments. But if we can claim those accomplishments, integrate those accomplishments, and then take those failures and then look at, okay, how could I have done this differently? What could I learn from this experience? How could I grow? How was this actually, and this is one of my favorite questions to ask when anybody fails, messes up, makes a mistake, etc. I ask, or loses someone, or experiences epic grief, I say, how is this the best thing that ever happened to you? And it's a hard question, especially if you're talking in terms of grief. Um, and I and I asked this this past year a lot because I lost three family members, including my my dad. And I still asked myself that question. I said, how is this the best thing that ever happened to me? And as much as I miss my dad, I still look at like, wow, I've got a lot of freedom now. Like my dad was an addict. And so growing up with that experience, it was challenging. And so I, once he passed, I was like, oh, I know he's free. And so I know that I no longer, like I'm now free to pave an entirely new path where I don't have that worry, that concern, that fear that, you know, is the other shoe going to drop sort of belief or fear. It's no longer even within my realm. Yeah. So it's not saying that like bad stuff isn't going to happen. Bad stuff right. does. Yeah. Um, but how can you grow from that? How can you turn that into happening for you instead of just to you? Because when I wasn't owning my stuff, from uh, after being bought out of my company, I had a year and a half where I was spiraling into blame and shame and complaining and comparison. And mm -hmm. comparison is just jealousy. And complaining is a way of getting validation. And many people will coddle to your valid to, to your desire to get validation for your excuses. Mm -hmm. Not many people will challenge you and be like, hey, you're complaining a lot. <laughs> um, let's like either work on it. And so in my family, we have a three complaint rule where it's like, oh, this is a problem. Oh, you want to, you want to complain about this? Okay, cool. Oh, we'll listen to it twice. And then by the third time, like, is this something that you either need to deal with? Or is this something that we need to maybe shift a perspective on? Because if mm -hmm. it's something, it's, it's going to be one or the other, or you need to drop it. Like, because that complaining, it turns into commiserating, which turns into just this cycle of perpetuating a pessimistic attitude on life. And that we then project onto others and then we pat take our complaining and it's like taking a backpack full of rocks and then we're like, oh, let me just complain to you. And then you just drop off your backpack on somebody else and, yeah. and, and people will pick it up because our society is kind of conditioned to do that. Yeah. And so in order to change, we first have to make those changes within ourselves. and true 100 percent ownership and radical responsibility means looking at the things that you're complaining about and saying, OK, how is this happening for me? What how can I grow from this? What what do I need to learn from this experience? Like it can be something as as simple as like, oh, you're complaining about something with, you know, I'm, I'm here in California with gas prices. Okay, what can I learn from the gas prices? What can I learn about what I value about money? What can I learn about what I value about spending my time on or what can I learn? What is this allowing me to grow into? Does this mean I need to grow into an another level of my business that like had scared me before because I now need to make more income to pay to, you know, go to my job? Does this mean mm -hmm. like allowing yourself to have that for you mindset rather than a to me mindset? And the to me mindset is very supported by a lot of by majority of society of being at effect at being at the victim side of the scale, whereas crowning yourself means taking true ownership because that's actually where you put yourself at cause, you put yourself in the driver's seat to actually cause a new response. Right. So you may not be able to change your circumstances, but you can definitely change how you respond to things. Thank you for that. Thank you for saying that because I don't think people understand that concept that not a lot of things are actually affecting you on purpose, you know, and a lot of people feel like like you said, this victim mentality, and it's crazy to encounter it because I'm surrounded with people who are like that. And I kind of have to just keep myself calm and keep myself in control because 
I can't control their perspective, but I can control my own. So when I'm around those type of people, I always just try to tell myself, it's just the way they think. It's just the way that their perspective is. I can't, I can't force them to change their perspective right now because they're stuck in a point of view. And there's a lot of people who are stuck in that point of view. So when I encounter individuals like yourself and who are just a little bit open-minded and who have a better understanding of life and what's going on around them, it's it's refreshing because it, it makes me realize that I'm not crazy thinking like this. Because sometimes they literally make you seem crazy. Like, how can you not worry? How can you not be upset? How can you not let this stress you out? And I'm just like... Because I learned to let it go. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so I guess my next question is, what would be like one of the things that you, what what's like a difficult situation that you kept on dealing with when it comes to like your clientele and the people that you have to work with, if you don't mind me asking? Um, how specifically? With, when it comes to business or when it comes to their leadership or? Oh, I guess something that you have encountered and I guess in an overall perspective, because you can really decide from any genre, really. Yeah, so yeah. Just, uh, so I guess it just depends something that you've encountered more and if it's more in business, if it's more in this or that, you know what I mean? Whatever. Yeah, I, would, yeah I, th- I, I think I have an idea where you're going with the question. Um, I think one of the number one things I have seen is uh boundary issues of not clearly defined boundaries um and sometimes when you're in it you don't necessarily know your boundary until it's being tested until it's being but what a boundary is and i just want to clarify what this is a boundary is if you do a i do b now so many people have wishy-washy boundaries which breaks their own self-integrity and when we erode our own self-integrity that's when things like our self-esteem and our self-worth begin to erode because we're not keeping the commitments that we make to ourselves as to how we deserve to be treated. So for example, if someone shows up chronically late and they're constantly late and they're constantly eroding that boundary, that is a choice that you are choosing to let them treat you that way on your part. So when you take ownership of, okay, I'm teaching people how to treat me, this person I understand like all like I'm a mom of two boys like sometimes something comes up and allowing a little bit of grace but also there is a boundary place there is a there is a line where you're like no this person keeps on showing up late or this person this once is a once is a fluke twice is a pattern is what I like to say and so when it's that space of okay this person keeps on showing up late for appointments and this is now crossing a boundary. So I'm teaching by me not saying something or by me not imposing some sort of consequence, like, oh, say for example, like a client keeps showing up late. They keep showing up 15 minutes late. And so instead the coach pushes their appointment an extra 15 minutes, which then bleeds into the coach's next client's time or their recovery time or their notes writing time. So it causes this ripple effect of wishy-washy boundaries that impacts other people. So mm-hmm. instead saying, oh, okay, I noticed that you showed up late the first time. And I, I noticed that this has now become a pattern. And I just wanna let you know, the hour starts when the hour starts. And if you show up late, that's gonna cut into your hour, but it's not gonna cut into my next client's hour. Like that's not fair for them. Mm-hmm. And so I wanna honor my next client's time. I wanna honor my time. And I would like you to honor your time so that you mm-hmm. actually get the maximum amount, amount of benefit that we are here for the time that we're here together. Correct. So being able to hold those boundaries of if you do A, I do B. And I see this with parents all the time too. When you say like, oh, like for us, we have a one, two, three policy in our house before my son gets sent to timeout. The other one's too little to be sent to timeout. He's only one. <laughs> he, he's not quite there yet. Um, yeah. Testing boundaries, but in a different way. So when my son starts, start, when we started putting my oldest in timeout, he's almost five. Um, we had a one, two, three policy. One was like, oh, you did that. Now, was that a good choice or a bad? Like, was that a good choice? Was that a solid choice? And oh, no, okay. But when he would make the mistake again, I'd say, okay, buddy, you know, you're testing the waters. And then he would do it the third time. That was immediate to timeout. If I did not 
send him to timeout, then that is eroding his trust in our relationship. So that is a space that, and thus they push further because they like that's, and that's pretty much any relationship. They're going to test that boundary as far as like, is this, you said this, can I, can I push this? Oh no, 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 she really means this. Oh, okay. This is what, this is a non-nego. Okay. All right. Now I trust my mom that when she says X, Y, and Z, I got to do X, Y, and Z or else B is going to happen. So, and, and understanding that there are those boundaries of what it, what you, stand for. And when you hold your boundaries with a person, then that builds your integrity. And then that teaches them in turn, because odds are, if that person's pushing your boundaries, they don't know what their boundaries are in their own life. And so you can teach people by your example of holding your own boundaries as to how they can treat themselves better. And I am of the belief system, and this was what my TED talk was on, was that we are warriors for possibility. And we have, we are walking, living, breathing examples of what's possible for our lives, for our mindsets, for our circumstances, and people are watching. So even though like, like Yitzi, what you said with like, sometimes there's some people around you are like, how can you not worry? The more they see you, they're like, eventually they'll be like, it's so weird. Yitzi never worries about this. Like, she's just not complaining about gas prices. She's just not worried about it. And, and eventually they'll be like, what are you doing? Like, what are you like? Eventually by our examples, because people listen far more to what we do than we, what, what we say, um, yeah. by our examples of how we be in this world, of how we be in integrity with ourselves, of how we be responsible and take ownership for our actions, of how we be with how we receive and accept feedback and growth and from the people that we choose to accept feedback and growth from like that's I also want to be clear like not everybody has a opinion that we need to accept and receive um, or a piece of feedback but when we start holding those boundaries and having that greater integrity with ourselves then people start saying I don't know what she's doing but like I I I want what she's having like she just doesn't seem to worry she seems to like kind of always have her stuff together she like I don't know how she's doing it now granted there will there will always be those people who will be very happy with complaining they won't really want to grow they won't really want to change and they're very comfortable with where they are even if where they are is very uncomfortable but they're comfortable with that level of discomfort and that's why people stay in abusive relationships that's why people uh, abuse their own bodies because they're very comfortable with that level of discomfort because it's familiar and Mm -hmm. our brains will always go to what's familiar so as soon as an outlier comes in like somebody who's thinking differently like somebody who's getting curious like somebody who's like there's got to be a better way to live life Mm -hmm. like there's got to be a a better way that's that's when people immediately will have those initial like who are you and like what have you done with with this person with who we knew you were who we thought you were but really yeah. you're just becoming more of who you actually are before you adopted plagiarized pl- programming and accepted other people's conditioning as your own correct that's so true oh my goodness thank you so much for your perspective and sharing it i have nothing against it like i am so woo woo i'm so for you really. you're so awesome i guess so we'll start wrapping up the show what would be some great advice that you can possibly give me and myself i know you already been giving us some great advice some great things to really for us to really think about when it comes to interacting with other people and our and ourselves and just for us to really take that moment of reflection and asking ourselves those hard questions that are needed nowadays but what else that you can possibly give us so that we can keep on thinking I think the biggest piece is to have compassion, like to recognize that somebody's perspective is their perspective based on their conditioning, their upbringing, their programming, their past little T traumas or sometimes capital T traumas, like and just being able to see that and have that perspective of like, wow, I have so much compassion on that person because that person is in the state of such unconscious incompetence that they don't know what they don't know and they don't know that they don't know it. So it's actually what's called the Dunning-Kruger effect where they think they know everything. Um, and they're like, of course, everyone thinks like this. And you're like, actually, not everyone does. And yeah. there's a different way and there's a better way. You just got to get curious. So have compassionate for those who 
are are kind of stuck in their ways and have compa- like recognize that by you having compassion for them, you're also having compassion for yourself as you nurture and grow your own perspectives, as you nurture and grow your own curiosities and keep remaining curious because it's through curiosity that is the mother of invention. And if we're going to transform this world into something amazing and completely disrupt certain systems that have not been working or efficient, um, then it's our job to remain curious and compassionate and keep on doing the work internally in here because that's the only way it's going to get reflected out there. Yeah, that's so true. Thank you so much. Thank you for your genuineness. Thank you for being so sincere. And oh, I could just feel you. You're just like radiating. You're just so, oh, so perfect. And like, I can your feel you too, way. Yitzi. You're amazing. <laughs> Like, I honestly don't know what to expect with any time I'm getting someone onto my show. But once I finally finish the conversation and I start wrapping it up, I just feel so much joy. It's like a little mini hug inside. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Thank you so much. And if anybody wants to know more about Kimberly, I have her beautiful photo on my website and a link that goes directly to her where you can find everything Kimberly, you know, and if you want to reach out to her to get a little bit better perspective perspective or just a better guide for your life because you just don't know where to go and you need an outsider's perspective go hit up Kimberly because she has a great perspective and I'm pretty sure that she'll help you understand from an outsider's point of view from what you are unable to see because we all have blinders on in our own lives and sometimes it's good to get that outside perspective so that we can see what we keep being blind to you know and everything that you have spoken I oh, I feel it in my heart I really do so I honestly say thank you for your time, your perspective, and for everything that you are, Kimberly. You are an absolute delight. And that's it. That's my show, y'all. Until next time. Bye. 